Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kaysen. This is episode two of our Vagrant Story analysis. Yes. We left off just after all the kind of opening cutscenes. Yep. Uh, Duke Bardorba was sending Rosencrantz in to Le Monde. Yeah. Uh, kind of finished up that scene. Last uh, frame that we saw was the, uh, the portrait of the Duke's family, his wife and son. And the kid, yeah. So we kind of wrapped that up. Now we're moving into Leomond itself. So, a yeah. little note that I took here about the city of Leomond. Um, Leomond is an old town with a history of over 2,000 years. Its walls have seen many battles. They are stronger than the mightiest forts of Valendia. And as the sun wheels through the sky, the beauty of their shifting colors surpasses that of any palace. The grand cathedral that towers over the town center is a symbol of Leomond's indomitable spirit and is the holy ground of the devout Iochus priesthood. At its height, Leomond was a thriving community, more than 5,000 people strong. 25 years ago, a great earthquake brought that chapter in Leomond's history to a close. So it was destroyed by an earthquake, which brought in like some flooding, basically. So, um, as Ashley arrives, Merlos is waiting for him just outside. They get a really nice kind of pa like panning shot that sort of like sweeps down and, and frames them kind of looking onto the city in the background. Yeah, it's nice. Um, and uh, so she kind of serves, in this scene, she kind of serves the purpose of like introducing us to the city itself and a little bit more uh, information about Sydney. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I wanted to mention with Leomond is um, the inspiration for the design of this city came from um, a, a real life town in France, particularly yeah. saint emilion that's the name of the town, in the region of Bordeaux. And this region, region was visited by one of Matsuno's colleagues who was a wine enthusiast and favored saint emilion one of the largest right. vineyards of Bordeaux. Um, so he was captivated by the town's uh, architecture. So the design team went on a trip to France to adopt these styles into the game. So that's where the... Nice. And you can really see that. Like, uh, we'll put some images up here of saint Emilion, and then, you know, kind of comparing that to, like, that sort of wide shot of Le Amand in the background. You, you totally see, like, the comparisons. Cool. So that's where basically all of the design for the architecture of this whole game. <laughs> when yeah. you're in Le Monde, it, it all comes from this town. And it's really, really well implemented. I really like the design of the city itself. It's like, it's got that sufficiently sort of like ancient feel to it. Yeah. Um, it's all kind of stone and... Stone and, um, well not stucco, but what would you call it? Plaster. Yeah, and like underground passageways. And yes. it's just like... Lots of them. Lots of cool stuff going on there, so. Yeah. That was the inspiration for Leomond's design. Nice. Um, so Ashley and Merlos meet outside the city, um, and she's explaining how there's basically only one way to get into the city now because the yeah, earthquake yeah. sort of brought in flooding so that like it, it, all the docks and things where, where you'd be actually able to pull in, like you can't access them. Yeah. So it's like you got to go through... This Not, underground well, passageway. They were saying something about whirlpools. Like the, oh, yes. There's a, they created a vortex or something, and there's whirlpools yeah. in random places. Taking a boat there would be very dangerous. Right. So they have to go from like across, I don't know if you'd call it a moat, but like a lake, right? You have to go underneath into the wine cellars, which lead like down underneath. I think that's crazy that it's under a lake. Yes. I, I, <laughs> it's kind of hard to Is imagine. that possible? Well, um, I, unless they built tunnels... And then the water, the water just didn't... Or like the, the water maybe flooded to a point where now it's covering what was originally like not covered by water or something Yeah, like but, um, but water gets places. It gets into things and into places. Let me so see here. Let that's crazy if we're going under a lake or under a river or I'm under sure a moat. I'm sure there's probably information on this in either the wiki or in maybe the um, Ultimania Guide. Mollenkamp's group grew so influential, Leomond became known as, uh, to many as the Dark City. The Temple of Kiltia was the center of Mollenkamp's activity. After the Valendian Civil War, the Iocas priesthood gained momentum and many followers converted, building the Grand Cathedral. 
This transformed the once dark city into a bustling metropolis. Monks in search of spiritual enlightenment dug deep below the city, opening up limestone quarries, creating what was known as the Undercity. So that was built at its height, right? Leomond was uh, famed for its quality wine, which rivals the Valendian produce. The fortress city entered its golden age with a population of 5,000. The dark tainted Leomond and the parliament wished to control it, deciding to empower it by feeding souls uh, to it. This is something that this is Rosencrantz talks about a little yeah. later. Yeah. In a devious scheme, 25 years uh, BGI. What does BGI mean? Don't know. Before, yeah, before Grand Incident? <laughs> Greylands Incident? Before, before Greyland, Greyland Incident. incident. That's probably I right. I think that could be it. Yeah, I think you're right. Kay. The water uh, diva, or deva, deva, diva, mm. Ma Merid, and the earth diva, Dao, were summoned to cause a catastrophic earthquake that killed the citizens of Leomon. The souls of the dead were consumed by darkness, and the phantoms, beasts, and undead roamed the empty city, now separated from the major landmass. So, yeah, it seems like those tunnels were built, and then Beforehand. these summons came and sort of like buried the city in water and things like that. So maybe the passages are They're sealed, very, very well made. Uh, but like sure. covered now by the lake or something like that. That would be my Kay. guess. If there's more information in the um, that makes mania, sense. I'll have to look that up. But. Well, my, and my initial thinking is why have the water if this was how we were going to go anyways? I think, um, I think the water, I think there's a lot of meaning for the water, especially later on as, um, who is it? Rosencrantz. I think is the one who says that Leomond is a wellspring, right? Oh yes, it's a wellspring of of the dark waters, right? Yeah. And so there's, it's definitely symbolic having the water be there. Oh, I think right? that's right. Yeah. Um, and so we're gonna go, and it just wouldn't be as interesting if we just went over the water, right? Yeah. You've right. got to like go places. If you yeah. just took a boat, and you're, that wouldn't be as interesting. So, yeah. anyways, they did it in a more interesting way. I just question about building tunnels under a lake or even having a flood not flood the tunnels. Sure, but, you know. yeah. Um, there's some text that comes on the screen saying, this, this actually is sort of tied to, if you haven't watched the second cinematic that you have to pause on the start screen. Oh, right, yeah. Where it had that text kind of in between the scenes that sort of oh, gave yes. the framework where it's like, one, yeah. it was like a report on Ashley Riot is like been blamed for murder. Yes, murdering the report. People. This is like tied into that. It's like continuing that on. Okay. But if you haven't seen that, then this would be the first time you're seeing text like this and it might be a little confusing. But what it says is, according to the survivors, our comrade Agent Riot headed out for my Leomond before noon. Of course, the reports are vague, and we cannot deny the possibility of inaccuracies. Yet, given that there is only one path to infiltrate Leomond, this office believes the reports to be valid. So there's only one way in, and it's through these wine cellars, right? Hmm. So Merlos and Ashley are talking uh, a little bit about Sydney. They kind of go down the steps into the, the entrance to the wine cellar. Yeah. And she's kind of talking about Sydney and Mullenkamp. Um, she says, indeed, he is in dark alliance with Duke Bardorba, who controls Parliament from behind the scenes. Right. That the cult is but a front. Perhaps this incident is a sign of some falling out between the two. And then Ashley says, or merely another of the Cardinal's witch hunts. And she says, there are many would-be prophets in the land these days, but Sidney is different. His prophecies ring true, and those enraptured by the way he hums revelations, as though... They were simple ballads. All the same, he is a miracle. In any case, he has a strange power. He can guess the past of those he meets. He can even read hearts. This is going to come in huge in mm -hmm. many of the scenes between Sydney and Ashley in the game. This yeah. is essentially like what Sydney is doing to Ashley almost every time they encounter each other. Yeah. He's reading his heart, kind of like reading his mind, right? Yep, yep, yep. So that's a power that Sydney has. Um, they say his charisma is such that followers offer both body and soul to him. And I like Ashley's response to this. Sounds like you're quite taken with him yourself. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> She's giving very glowing praise to <laughs> the enemy who's going to kill everybody. Yeah, so this is a really interesting, particularly after like the opening sequence where Sydney is sort of introduced as a villain of the story. For her to yeah. be talking about him in this yes. way that gives him a, di a totally different dimension. Right. It's like... He's in dark alliance with Duke Bardorba. He's got all these powers, 
but he's got this charisma and yeah, and the people really like him. him. Yeah, and even like they're kind of giving a little bit of info as to how he, you know, the way he. It's it's basically his charisma, but you can almost intuit some type of mind, not mind reading, mind control yeah. type of powers that he has. Yes. He's so charismatic that even just this woman talking about him, giving a report, Agent Melrose, <laughs> is just like, it sounds like she's already falling for him, yep. despite you know being mm -hmm. separated from him. Just, you know, anyways, it's fascinating. So it's, it's a nice little like extra dimension they're giving to Sidney yeah. here. And it gives more mystery to his character. This isn't just a villain. Like there's more to this guy. Yep. And um, this will come into effect as Sydney and Ashley begin to meet more often in the story. Um, so Ashley's like, all right, he's gonna head in. He kind of opens the door and walks in and-, and She offers to go with him and he's yeah, like, you like, have no training. Nope. <laughs> go, I, I, I don't need alone. you. Yeah. I work alone. I think he mentions to Rosencrantz later even, because uh, Rosencrantz is like, I was <laughs> sent to Lend yeah. aid, and he's like, yes. risk breakers work alone. He's like, I'm you a risk breaker. Know that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> so he's like, he actually doesn't want to work with anybody. He wants to work alone. It's kind yeah, of a yeah. risk breaker thing. Yeah. But so, anyways, as she turns to leave to go back up the stairs, Sydney comes walking down. So yes. it's like, and you she don't gets know right exactly <laughs> what happens there, but yeah, yeah. she gets captured. Um, I've got this here. Um, there's no saying they bypass the water, electing instead to pass underground. Right, so yeah. instead of going over the water, they go underground, which mm -hmm. is also under the water because they're yes. going underneath. And then they pass through a wine cellar yes. in order to get to where they're going, right? And then there's the gate that comes up. You cross through the gate and it shuts. There's a beat. As soon as um, Ashley walks through the gate and it shuts, he hears like a sound and it's like a poof, and he looks behind him as if, oh, and right. it's after we know that Mel Merlos was just captured by Sydney. But he looks back and he's like, Something strange yeah. is going on here, right? Mm. But the going underground, the underwater, as well as the wine. And wine, I think, plays a maybe, we'll discuss later, I think, whether, the, whether or not the full like symbolism of wine is born throughout the game. Because at the moment, it's just this, but there is a mention later on with mm. the family and stuff. Yeah. Um, but he is passing deep into like the unconscious, basically. <laughs> he's, he's going into a, 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 a spiritual realm. He's gone to the underworld, yeah. essentially, right? This is like a, um, like a, sort of like an initiation type thing going into essentially an ancient temple, mm. which is what it seems like yeah. this place is, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating stuff. Um, some archetypes going on there. Yeah, some of that stuff's going on there. And, but it's very cool the way that they do it. And you know, it's a wine cellar, but you don't really think of it. But it's like, no, he's passing through a wine cellar as though he's passing through wine, which symbolizes two things. Wine, wine is like right on the border between the sacred and the profane, right? Yeah. Wine could either be the redemptive power of Christ's blood, or it can be the passageway to the underworld where you just, you're, you are lost right and you're just completely unconscious right mm. and you lose yourself right but it's right in the middle it's like right there between sacred and profane but when you go underground it becomes it becomes the profane right yeah. anyways it's it's fascinating stuff but it's yeah. clearly like he's being initiated into a temple that is you know got some dark, spiritual powers dark yes a dark temple, temple for yeah. for sure but that beat when the door shuts and it's just like he knows things are amiss you know it's it's very very interesting so then we get another um excerpt from the graylands incident investigation report right which is oh, revealed yeah. what this is a reference to we sent men to monitor the abandoned mine shaft that leads to Leamond. all were found dead oh yeah at the entrance other bodies were found two knights of the cardinal's crimson blades our men were murdered with swords, but the knight's wounds show they died by their own hands. Yes. Once again, hinting to the mind control yeah. power of Sydney. It's like these people yeah. killed themselves. And what did what did she what did Merlot say that um, that his followers offer body and flesh? Yes, body and yeah, body and flesh. I think is what something like that to to him, right? And so it's like okay, people kill themselves for him. Also, probably a yeah. sexual thing. They say his charisma is such that followers offer both body and soul. To body him. and soul. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right, and that's a that's an important yep. distinction within this world. 
We'll, we'll get to that later. But yeah, this guy, Sydney can make people do things, for uh -huh. sure. He says, at present, we have taken the bodies into our custody and our specialists are continuing the examination. So that then it says, excerpt from the Gray Lancet in Investigation Report Section 314. Yeah. And then uh, you kind of get into the game itself. Uh, this is the f like where the game really kind of starts, where you're running through. And this game yeah. is, um, I was kind of, we were kind of joking about this on the way over here. It feels like the game is like 80% <laughs> menu navigation. <laughs> yeah, about spend a lot of times in the menu. 15% box puzzles and platforming. Yeah, yeah. And then like 5% cutscenes. Yeah. So we're focusing on the story on this podcast. That's kind of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're jumping like a lot of gameplay to get to each cutscene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, quite but, a bit. But story-wise, it's, it's not that it's completely irrelevant. It's yeah. just that it's kind of pretty irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is another sort of hallmark of Yasumi Matsuno games. Yeah. It is short cutscenes with yes. lots of gameplay and then short cutscene, yeah. long gameplay. And some people criticize it for that, and I think that that's well, pretty valid. Like, yes. it, there's not like a, a necessarily maybe the balance you would hope for between story and gameplay. Right. It's mostly just playing the game and then you get these, but I really like the sharp pacing and, and the clip. Me too. And the flow of the cutscene. I wonder if it was, if you stretched it, the story out longer and you put in more cutscenes and you made them longer, um, I wonder if they would have been as punchy, if yeah. they would have been as good. I think right. we said the same thing about tactics as well. Yeah. Were you to make the game into a more story-oriented game, they would have told different stories. They, yeah. they would have been a little bit too different in my opinion, especially. Um, I really think that the boundaries define the art in yeah. this regard, and that the art within the boundaries is so punchy, so sharp, so poignant. Yeah, the way that I would go about addressing that problem, if you want to call it that, yeah. would be not to touch the cutscenes, but to reduce mm. the gameplay in Just make the, the game cutscenes. shorter. Make the game a little shorter. I wonder if uh, the executives had something <laughs> to say about that, and that's why the gameplay's so long. I don't know, but um, it's, it, it is kind of common of his games, right? Like Tactics Ogre and uh, um, what is it? Uh, the original Ogre Battle, um, oh. uh, March of the Black Queen, oh, yeah. and Final Fantasy Tactics, right? It's like, Final Fantasy Tactics in particular, which we just covered, it's like a two minute cutscene. Yes, yeah, so even by like, shorter than this. Followed by like a 30 minute battle, followed by <laughs> yeah. like a two minute cutscene. <clears throat> yeah. You know, so it's, it's, that's kind of the way it works. And the, the problem yeah. I think people have with it is that you're taken away from the story for such a long period that yeah. you kind of forget. I agree with that. What was happening I agree with before. That. Yeah. And so it's like connecting things can become tougher. So yeah. I think that that's a valid criticism of his, of his games. And I think reducing the amount of time between cutscenes by just like making the gameplay either tighter or faster or just cutting some things yeah. would probably help with that. Um, but in any case, though, really we're going to start jumping a lot of things <laughs> <coughs> yeah. in order to get to the next cutscenes. <laughs> so um, that's just kind of how it's going to go. But again, if you want like more of a breakdown of the gameplay of Vagrant Story, I have a whole video I did up, up, up on that last week, Monday, um, that breaks down the gameplay and things like that. So um, we're going to kind of ignore most of that, though you did have some notes on some of the environments and things like that. <laughs> yeah, I did. So <coughs> It's less battle-oriented, but more just, yeah, Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the next like kind of cutscene that you see is uh, Ashley comes across two Crimson Blade soldiers uh, speaking about a grimoire that has locked like a door. They're like trying to get through a door yep, that's yep. locked and they can't get in there. And they're discussing um, the power of grimoires and how they work, and, and some of the like the lore of the city of Leamon and things like that. They're kind of going back and forth. I love their accents too. They yeah. they seem a little more like country countryside English, you know. Yeah, th there's actually a really great <coughs> comparison here um, that uh, um, 
Alexander O. Smith gives in the interview, the oh, Schmuplations yeah. interview oh, yeah. that I posted in the pinned comment last week on mm-hmm. last week's episode, where he was talking about some of the liberties he took to, to f- give the text flavor in English versus sort of like a more direct, what a more direct translation would read like. Yeah. A more direct translation of what they say here would be, Soldier A says, is this magic stuff really that easy to use? Mm. And Soldier B says, if you believe the studies of ancient legend, there were these grimoires that let anyone use it. This is, uh, he's, he goes on to say, this is exposition, sure, but uh, couched convincingly in dialogue that helps build the characters of the two soldiers. So classic Matsuno. Good stuff, doesn't need any fixing. The direct translation is fine too, really very clear, and doesn't stray from the intent of characters as presented in the Japanese, as long as we're just looking at the text. But consider the setting, and we start wanting the text to do a little more to flesh out the world in English. Mm. So here's the final text. Soldier A says, swine will take wing for the likes of us use magic, my friend. Yeah. And Soldier B says, aye, but with a grimoire, your fattest sow could outfly my swiftest falcon, if you believe the chroniclers. Now that's yeah. a little bit of the word play that is common in Shakespeare, right? This is, uh, this is what makes it have the flavor in English that I really like, right? So if we go back to the first example, is this magic stuff really that easy to use? If you believe the studies of ancient legend, there were grimoires that let anyone use it, right? Fine. Mm-hmm. But here, he's using a metaphor, like an analogy, which yeah. is common. Pigs, of, pigs fly. Yeah. Swine yeah. will take wing for the likes of us can use magic. And he play, the soldier bee plays off of that analogy yes, right, with yeah. the wordplay. Yeah, Aye, yeah. but with a grimoire, your fattest sow could outfly my swiftest falcon. Right. That is the flavor that I freaking adore of this style yeah, of dialogue. Yeah. I love it. I like it a lot. It's, it just, it just, um, it it makes you think. M- you have to think harder to like put it together. It's just, yeah. It, it, the, it's what's the word? That's the term I'm looking for. It's like you have a plain, simple line of dialogue. It's like you don't have to think that much about it. Versus this version where it's like you have to be more engaged yeah, in sure. the reading of yeah. it, right? To like put it together. It's but, like but more once you put it together, it paints a better picture. Yeah. And, and something that sticks more uh, that's more likely to stick. That's something that's more likely to be internalized yes. through the imagery. Yes. Right? Because magic, oh, is this magic real? Yeah, well, the word magic is hard to picture, yes. right? And then a grimoire, okay, you can just think of a book, I suppose. But the way that they talk about it here yeah. is like, oh, but they're, they're using an analogy, which, yes. which is, yeah, it's much better. Yeah, and I think that that, that sticks better. I was talking to yeah. someone about this. It's kind of like the whole concept of like parables, right? Yes, you yeah, could yeah. just like flatly state like your, if, if you're an instructor or a teacher or something, you could just flatly state the facts of the thing. Yeah. Or you could create <clears throat> a parable that demonstrates it, that gives an analogy yeah. of it, you know, a metaphor for the concept. Right. That people have to like sort of work in order to piece it together. Right. And that work that you're doing in your mind is what makes it stick. Yes, that's part of the, the <laughs> yes. whole thing, yeah. Right. It's not just the end point, it's the work that you put into it to understand it and then yeah. Which is why I love this dialogue and why I love Shakespeare because he did wordplay like this. Yeah, yeah. One person uses this sort of uh, social or, or maybe contextual analogy to the time or something like that, right? And another person takes that and plays off of that to make like a similar analogy yeah. to make a counterpoint. Right, yes, And yes. I love that. It's. It's um what it's a display of wit yes as well yes so so it's interesting to read as right. opposed to yeah they in feel addition. they feel like <clears throat> closer comrades yes where yeah, yeah. they're 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 they bantering can take each other's words and yeah. and turn them around right. yeah they're bantering instead of just like flatly stating can you really use magic and it's like well if you believe the the legends. <laughs> That's it. That's all there is to the dialogue. Right? It's like these people could have met yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. But then you read it down here and it's like, nah, these people know each other. They're right. buds. They, they've been around. Right. 
And so this is the kind of thing that Alexander Smith, and someone wanted me to also mention the editor Rich, um, okay. who, who was also, you know, very, he's the editor, so sure. they work together. You work together yeah, yeah. very closely with your editors to, you know, like really nail the text. So that Alex and Rich were really closely working together in all this. But okay, nice. I think that that's the flavor they added to the English text that just really makes it work for me. Yeah. Um, without going overboard, without it being so archaic or sounding so flowery that it starts to feel like, oh, this doesn't feel natural for right, me to talk Right, like they're this not way. saying anything. Right. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you do things like this, um, talking in stories, parables, analogies, uh, you're layering what you're saying as well. There's multiple layers to everything you say. Yeah. Um, so it's not just the words themselves, but it's also what the words mean on a different level that yes. is like, oh, that you can attach that. And that both both are true but different in different ways, you know, yes. but both are like, and but you can stack different layers of meaning. You can yeah. do different callbacks. You can use different analogies. You can, um, you can insert like allegory yeah. and you can do metaphor in, and, and symbols, specifically symbols, to where a story can have like 10 layers of meaning, like yes. all the way down. And that makes it so much more expanding for your mind. Because yeah. like you can just read the first line and be like, oh yeah, of course. But um, understanding the subtext and everything underneath it, yeah. that it's not just fun. It literally helps your mind to work better. It keeps you fluid. Yeah, you know? and uh, this is something I've talked about in other videos. I kind of talk about the three keys of dialogue that I feel like make good dialogue, right? Yeah. So one is sort of like the the flow or the pacing at which exposition is given. You know, how much do we give now? How much do we save for later? Yeah, yeah. Do we like bog down everybody or do we give it in pieces yeah. throughout? Or do we have it in skippable cutscenes <laughs> that you can just get right in the game and kill people? Right. <laughs> so I, I would call that maybe the clip or measure at which exposition is given through dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Repetition, so mm. like avoiding tedious repetition of yeah. dialogue. I've ranted about that a lot mm -hmm. in the past. And then um, subtlety or, or um, subtext mm -hmm. being like a big one. So like characters not saying exactly what they think all yes. the time. Yes. Um, being deceptive or, or feeling like, oh, I shouldn't say this. But you, you right. read underneath the text what they really feel. Right? And one of the most important things that you read under the text when you have to read under the text yes. is that these people are more human. Yes. Right? And, right. and the fact that you have to read under the text makes them more human in a, in a yeah. weird way. Because yeah. we rarely say what we really feel. Right. And so the fourth one that I would add to this yeah. is wordplay of this mm. kind. Using, uh, depending on the culture or the, the characters speaking to each other, what culture do they come from, how do they talk, yeah. accents and things like that. But how would they go about word playing off of each other in ways that, mm. that gives this text flavor and makes you work a little bit more to understand what they're saying, yeah. it, particularly with these sorts of analogies to get yeah. across a point. That's like my fourth thing for me that like makes dialogue really, really good. If you're doing all four of those, it's like nice. dialogue will read awesome, right? So I really love the dialogue here, but they're yeah. talking about this. They're talking about um, grimoires, the city of Leomond, that sort of thing. And then and they, I think they introduced the idea of a grand grimoire. Right? Not is that, quite. Is that later? That's later. Okay. That's uh, uh, what's uh, Samantha and uh, oh, okay. Guildenstern. Guildenstern. Later. But they do mention that Guildenstern has some powers, and so they're like, yeah. they're talking about, man, like, you know, this is kind of crazy what's going on here, right? Like, they're more or less introducing the magical nature of Leomond. They are. And, you know, one guy's very unsure about it, and like, yeah, yeah. kind of like, uh, and the other guy's well, like, intrigued. these are. These are the knights of the priests, right? Yes, These the, are the, the religious blades. knights. Yeah. <clears throat> and so they're introducing their religious speak into all of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, oh, the, the power is great. Yeah, but all I need is the power of God, you yes, know? And it's right. like, oh, but the power of God is <laughs> not when confronted to the darkness of the true power. Ah, yeah. yes, but of course. Anyways, it's fascinating stuff. But they're definitely uh, showing the, the dichotomy, the difference between the good magic and the bad magic, yeah. the, the godly right. and then the, the dark. So Ashley is listening into this conversation, yeah. sort of hiding, but he gets startled by the fact he sees a ghostly yeah. boy. A young kid ghost yeah. shows and up. And he's like, whoa, what's that? And he sort of like shifts her 
uh, makes a noise and yeah. it alerts the guys to his presence. So yep. some of the Indians kind of battle. So now we have to kill them all. So he kills them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and continues on. Um, but really nice scene. Again, short, like nice pacing to it, but yeah. it's beginning to initiate, that was the word you used, Ashley into this yes, exactly. sort of like the lore of this city, right? Right. Um, <laughs> I had the link to that oh, right dude. there the whole time. Um, so the next scene uh, shows Guildenstern commanding his knights to take Ashley out. And at first it's kind of like, ooh, wow, that's intense because this yeah. is a commander of the Crimson Blades directly telling them to attack a VKP, a VKP member. Yeah. Right. But right at the end, it's revealed this is actually Sydney, who is like disguised yes. as and Guildenstern. Whoa, what did I put here? Sydney can transform into people. This will make things very interesting later on. Yeah. So it's good that they introduce that before some time later in the game where you think you're talking to one person and it's actually Sydney and it's like, what? I didn't know he could do that. And it just sounds, it seems cheap. Yeah. Kind of. They introduce the fact that he's capable of transforming how he looks and sounds yeah. in front of people yeah. into somebody else, right? That's that's important. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it kind of gives us more insight into Sydney's powers, like what he's capable yeah. of doing, um, and how he's sort of like, just sort of, he, he's kind of like all over the place for this game. Yeah, just he's like manipulating things. Deceiving here, manipulating yeah. these people here, just sort of like pulling the strings around you can tell he's kind of living on the edge of a knife a little bit. Yes. Um, and especially as his partner, Harden, you know, yeah. Tarden kind of chastises him a little bit later on, we'll see. Um, he, um, Sydney is like this close to losing it all the time. Yeah. But he's keeping everything moving in, in the proper place to everyone goes where he wants them to be and everyone's doing what he wants them to do. Mm -hmm. But he is like so close. He's just dancing on the edge, basically. Yep. And it, it's fascinating. When people are capable of doing that, it is captivating. Yeah. To, to um, Merlo's point that you know you can see this happening and even the people with him are like, this is crazy. We're so close to losing it. And Sydney's yeah. just like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. But he's playing it so close to the edge. It's and, and I love the way that they reveal that, again, a little at a time, particularly in the scene where Sydney decides he's going to go like confront Guildenstern face to face. Oh, we'll yeah. get to that in a minute, but it's like it shows yeah. that like he doesn't quite anticipate everything. Yes, and, and sometimes he might make mistakes and right. things like that. And so, yeah, like you're saying, he's he he knows what he's doing, but at the same time, there's very small room for error. In yes, <laughs> yet he's taking chances that yeah. he's taking chances, and when you're on the edge already, yeah. you know that's a da dangerous thing to do. But that's how he that's how he lives. So later on, um, Ashley is, sees a vision of a large, like, single tree in a peaceful field, right? Oh, yeah. And he sees that same boy that he saw earlier, the ghost figure, uh, kind of steps out. And then it, it sort of cuts to black here, and the word Papa comes on screen in yes. red letters. Like, yeah. like, really, like, scarlet, bright red. Um, and so he, he's seeing this boy. And this is another sort of emergent kind of property of Leamon that we'll learn more and more about as we go throughout it. It's like Leamon has this way of like, re, like revealing, also like emergent powers in people. Like people start to gain powers just by being in there. Like the, yes. just being in the city, like you start to like em powers emerge yes. from you. Yeah, but yeah. also this in his mind, this, his central sort of like con internal conflict. Oh, it's yeah. like the city is like partially like bringing this out of him, which is yes. something that we're going to start learning is all about suppressed memory. Yes. Well, but as I mentioned previously, when Ashley goes down into the unconscious. Yeah. He is going into his own unconscious yes, as well. Yes, right. And that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, every yeah. game we do has been like playing, every game we've played lately has kind of had a, some type of theme or yeah. other with that, um, you know, the idea of the unconscious and just the general, you know, psyche exploration. Yeah. But this one is, is just does it just as well, you know? Yep. And they're going in there and, and as he is confronting the unconscious of the this dead city, you know, he's also confronting his own unconscious as well. And things are coming forth and he's seeing things yeah. that that 
he would say, oh, I don't know what this is, but it's like, no, this is you. Yes. This is your, this, this is, is your what mind. you need to confront. This is your memory, and you're fighting yourself in mm-hmm. some way. Yeah, I love yeah. it. So we're starting to see the first signs of that with this boy that he keeps seeing, right? Yeah. Um, and is it right after this that Sydney shows up? Well, you fight a Minotaur boss. This is like the first <laughs> kind of real boss yes. of the game. I yeah. really love the reveal too, because it's like the camera is inside of like almost a grate, and you just see its feet. Like, yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. Kind of oh, and in. we should probably mention that as we're going through this whole place, there's little mini earthquakes keep happening. Oh yes. That as we're traveling through, it's just like every now and then it's just like, and yeah. every time, um, Ashley is just like. Uh, that was a big one, yeah. or oh dang, what's happening? I hope it's not going to block the exit or the right. entrance or mm-hmm. something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but apparently, Leomond is a place that just is constantly experiencing aftershock type earthquakes ever since that first big earthquake yeah. 25 years ago. Right. And it's just always shaking, right? Yeah. And no one likes going here. It's just a cursed place. So there was an earthquake that happened here. Oh, yes, uh, uh, just in a year Magna, or two ago. Yeah. Which is um, about. I would say 20 miles west of where I live. Yeah, I didn't I don't know feel how anything. You, how you I guys felt anything. it down south. Yeah, But I'm one, sure you would have. It was intense. Yeah. It woke me up. Yeah. And things were shaking to the point where they were getting like ready falling. to fall. Yeah. And I was, this first time I'd ever experienced that before. No, really? Um, I'd never been in an earthquake before. That's right? so funny because we're, we're on a fault I know. line. But I actually don't either. The first yeah. one I remember experiencing was in LA and then in Japan. Yeah. I don't think I've ever felt one here in Utah. Yeah. And because uh, uh, kind of the way that it happens is it's almost like there's sort of a big one that happens about every 150 years or so. Yeah. Yeah. In this region. But it's yes. never one of those massive, massive, destructive, like nine Richter yes. scale ones. It's like in the six, seven, eight range right. um, is kind of what they predict for that, right? But anyways, this one was about a 5.5. So it wasn't like, mm. it didn't cause massive damage, but it but definitely it, But you were close to the epicenter though. Yeah. yeah. And there were aftershocks for days uh. after this. And so it was really unsettling. Yeah. That like every time it would start, I would kind of grip my chair like, should I run for the exit? Is this like, the big one? Yeah, what's coming? happening? Is there going to be another one? It's it's a scary feeling. Yeah. Um, I know that people in Japan have probably really gotten used to it more because they just have oh, earthquakes all the time Every in couple Japan. weeks there's something, So, yeah. you know, I, it, maybe even people in California but, have a little bit more yeah. familiarity. They've been through it enough to where it doesn't feel that way. But. Because it happens so often, though, that they have constructed their buildings is such that they yeah. can withstand lots right. of smaller earthquakes, right. you know. Whereas you come further inland in the United States and it's like, well... Where places that don't have them as much, the building code isn't up yeah. to like right. earthquakes every couple of weeks level, you know. <laughs> right. So it's like you just you never know. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, I I do remember Ashley sort of being like, "Oh, wow," and I, I, that feeling is something I felt for like yeah. several days afterwards, being like, "I'd just be working or something," and then it's like, "Oh no, oh fetch the oh, the fetch. earth man, oh fetch, <laughs> is it gonna happen again?" Um, you just have no control. But these were just aftershocks, right? They're just small ones, and those yeah, yeah. linger for days, sometimes weeks after the initial uh, big earthquake. So Yeah, they can. Um, the idea of the earthquake, though, is the ground becoming unstable, which is the idea of instability. And, yeah. and instability means a lack of ability to predict the future, basically. Sure. Right? So, lay a mond, and that would be why everyone left. It's not just like one earthquake... Because the city is still, like, there. Mm. Like, I know it was a bad earthquake, but, like, the city, most of the buildings are actually yeah. still in shape. In, in and intact. the city could very much still be lived in. Yeah. Uh, but the inst- instability means that there is no foreseeable future. Yeah. And when there's no foreseeable future, people go somewhere else. Right. Somewhere where they can see a future. Yes. You know? Right. I, I like this too because Sydney loves this place. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, Sydney has some future seeing abilities, yeah, right? True. That other people true. don't have. Yeah. So he's like, okay, I'll make my home here because I can see past the instability into some type of future that he can, you know, help yeah, bring about. That's true. Anyways, that's good I love it. Um, so, anyways, after fighting this boss, right, this Minotaur boss, first boss of the game, you kind of get introduced to this. And this is something that will happen throughout the game. You you unlock abilities uh, yes, yeah, that yeah. were suppressed yes. in Ashley's memory. So Ashley kind of falls yeah, down. Yeah, the first time it happens, he's yeah. like, 
He's what is going it's on? It's like he's kind of getting shocked. There's some yeah. like electrical sort of effect happening. And he's like, oh. And then it says uh, Ashley has unlocked uh, you know, an ability from his suppressed memory. Yes, from his suppressed memory. So now you yeah. can use this forever. Right. Yeah. And right on the back of that, so right on the back of that information, yeah. oh, his memory is suppressed. Yes. And he's gaining abilities that he suppressed. I love this, dude. I love this. Sydney shows up. And he's clapping his metal hands. <laughs> yep. ching, ching, ching. I love that. It's so <laughs> funny, dude. Um, and he starts talking about how he has no soul. He says, um, yeah. how do you do it? Body and soul are one, yet yours are separate, like a child from the night in his storybook. Where is your soul, Risk Breaker? Is this VKP training? Or did mm. you see something that made you shut your soul away? Show me your soul. So that's what show me your soul. Yeah, he, he starts reaches doing towards his him. heart reading, mind reading kind of thing, yeah. right? That power that he has, and he invokes the vision of that tree in the field again. And Ashley sees a woman and a boy sort of having some kind of like picnic sort of you know meal together um, under the shade of this tree. Um, you know, you kind of see him interacting. I think it's a little bit later, the scene gets extended a little bit where he's like trying to offer his eight-year-old son wine. We'll his, talk about that later, yeah. <laughs> and his, his wife's like, don't you dare give him wine. <laughs> you, I'll get water, you dare give him wine, I'll be pissed. Yeah. I think that comes later, but. They do show something like an implication that he was the kid's father. Yes. Right, and yes. that's kind of how this memory is written. And then uh, the woman and the boy are murdered by these as he refers to them, uh, fallen knights or jackals. Mm, uh, jackals, Sort of like yes. rogue knights or whatever that yeah. came and just slaughtered his wife and son. And so he's, this vision is invoked, and Sidney says at the end of this, you killed your beloved wife and child. Now there's a lot more to yeah. that than we, than we know at this point. Yes. Right? Like that'll be revealed later. But... Uh, Ashley responds to that, they were slain by fallen knights, jackals. Wrong, you failed to protect your wife and child. You failed in your duty as a knight, as a husband and as a father. You killed them. And Ashley gets pissed at that. And so he, he, he kind of jumps and does this cool sort of like soft landing yeah. over here. Try to catch me, uh, catch me, Ashley Riot. Look outside yourself and find your truth. And Ashley says, what is your game? And he says, uh, Sydney says, the city of shade will forgive your sins, uh, my son, and call forth a power, a power that lies within you even now. This is my game. I run, you give chase. I am the heart, spelled H-A-R-T, which is it's like a, a rabbit. rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> I am the heart and you the hunter. But this heart has laid a few snares of his own. I'm waiting for you, risk breaker. So Ashley, or Sydney, has taken an interest in Ashley here. He yeah. like... He's involved him in some kind of game. He has a plan for him now. And he wants to use <clears throat> Ashley, uh, Ashley's soul or power. Yep, for something. The power over souls, I guess, because he can't locate Ashley's soul, it seems. There's a separation there. Um, and he's going to use him. And it seems like Ashley is, you know, absorbing the powers of the darkness as yes. he goes throughout all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And Sydney will be using him to then do something later on. Yeah, so he looks into his heart and he decides... All he's right. the one. You're the one I'm going to yeah, use yeah, yeah. for my plan here. Yes. Right. So he's stringing him along. Yeah. Sydney is stringing Ashley along for a purpose. Really great scene. Really, really loved it. Um, oh, yeah. this is where, actually, we kind of went out of order. This is where he's overcome by that energy, and then he recovers battle abilities from a suppressed memory. So it's after the scene with Sydney. Okay, so that. it's after. Um, and also, I've got that Sydney is really taking after the theme of Final Fantasy Tactics <laughs> a lot. Yeah. As Sydney's talking, we're getting a lot of Saint Ajora type of, or as everybody, I think just the, some of the stuff that Sydney says just in general is like that. But the whole idea of Saint Ioka, is that it? Uh, I, the Iokas Priesthood, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, is the name of. Yeah. There, there is a similar kind of theme going on here. Yeah. With there was an ancient group of people and there was some revered saint that showed up but then there was also a bunch of really bad people mm -hmm. and then that was forever ago but now here we are and we're like gonna redo yeah. some of the things that were done in the past right yep so some very uh, Final Fantasy Tactics related stuff here I, I took a note here too that you know the, the the it's more than just a trope of JRPGs it's almost become some kind of like fundamental part of the whole genre, which is the 
amnesiac protagonist, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and I, ha- I kind of have like conflicting feelings about that. Yeah. Like on, on one hand, I see it almost like rejection of the call in the hero's journey. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. It's like that's just a part of it. But it's a convenient <laughs> reason to reject the call, which is... Right. It, it, it's like rejection of the call is just a thing that happens in the hero's journey right. archetype or story. Yeah, Joseph Campbell's. Yeah. It's just... It, 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 you just accept it. It's a part of what it is. Yeah. There's a part of me that like wants to think of amnesiac protagonists and JRPGs like that. Yeah. It's just like this is just baked or like part of the DNA of the genre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's another part of me that thinks that um, it's used in some really lazy ways no, to be a convenient um, way to withhold information. Yeah. That uh, is not, in my opinion, very clever. Like very cleverly executed in as a way of withholding yeah. that information. It's just we can we can use this very convenient plot device and mm. say, bam, he hit his head and he doesn't remember his past. So now we can string you along with a bunch of mysteries. That's when it's used poorly. <laughs> and Absolutely. it's not even just in JRPGs. Yeah. This is going back to like the nineteen fifth like nineteen fifteen, nineteen twenties. Yeah. A lot of like silent films sort yeah, yeah. of like started this too. Sure. So I have conflicting feelings on it, and there are some games where I really don't like its use, and there are other games where I really like it. And I've been thinking about right what, what separates is the them. distinction, yeah, yeah. like what makes one more appealing to me, and what makes the other feel I don't know, just not interesting or just yeah. like oh again we're doing mm-hmm. this again, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that in part, and this was some of the research I was doing today, so you'll have to forgive me. This, you'll have to take some of what I'm saying now as more of a conversation starter than me educating oh, sure. people. Because this was literally like maybe two hours of Google research. <laughs> so I'm by <laughs> no means an expert on this. But I was trying to get at least some idea um, about how I feel about the difference between, because he does not have amnesia. Ashley doesn't. He has suppressed memories. Yes. So I like that. It's like it's like a spin yeah. on the trope. It's like Ashley's memory is still being withheld from us as a plot device, but it's done in a way that's more interesting than he just smacked his head and now he forgot everything. Yeah, yeah. Right? Which is not something that happens very it's commonly. It's a pretty rare thing. The, yeah. the parts of your brain that are... that will be affected by retrograde amnesia, the damage that has been are way deep. Like oh, yeah. Way deep in the brain. Huh. Uh, the, the thalamus. What, the amygdala? And, which, and, which is near like the hippocampus, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like way deep, way, way, way oh, deep the in the center of the brain. That makes sense, actually, yeah. yeah. That part has to be severely damaged in order for the type of retrograde amnesia you see in movies and games to happen. So it's not like it doesn't happen. It does. And, you know, there's, there's all these different classifications of what can happen. Sometimes yeah. you get retrograde and anterograde amnesia, uh, anterograde, both, yeah. where it's like your, your memories up to the point of the trauma um, are forgotten, yeah. right? But you also have trouble making new memories. Yes. But it can also be you don't have that. You can make new memories, but you just can't remember what happened before that trauma. Right. And sometimes it's kind of localized to where it's like it's maybe two years or five years but you still remember your childhood Mm -hmm. so there's all these different sort of ways of classifying the type of amnesia right but the point is is that you either have to be infected with an illness or have like a really severe stroke (coughs) or have severe head trauma for this to happen Um, and so I mean yeah you could say character had like super severe head trauma but like Okay, I'll just bring this up as an example. I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to like rail on the game or anything like that, or say it's terrible. It's a whole other conversation. We may even cover this game in the future. But in Fantasia, oh, yeah. which is um, the the most recent game from here in Obusaka Gucci, right yeah. uh, on Apple Arcade, um, the character suffers head trauma in the opening scene and wakes up and is like yeah, forgets right. his memories, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, some of the cases I was reading about this were like a person would be unconscious for literally hours. Like that mm. kind of 
severe head trauma. Now I think mm -hmm. they in in Fantasia they try to make it like it was a magical explosion. So whatever oh, magical sure. properties affected this, right? So there's right, magic yeah, involved. Yeah. But the point is the point is <laughs> that some of the ways in which they depict retrograde amnesia in movies and games is it's such an uncommon thing. Yeah. Um, that it's kind of like, uh, like, but they're just using it as like a, a an easy plot device to withhold information. Yeah. So, anyways, this is a long-winded way of getting to the point of saying like I have conflicting feelings on it because I do understand the argument that this is just like uh, the mentor character and rejection of the call or belly of the whale. Right. It's, it's just, just one of those a part of the storytelling DNA. Of JRPGs, <laughs> yeah, right? for whatever reason, I get that. Yeah, but I still tend to enjoy that more when you try to go a little bit further with it than just guy knocked his head and he forgot everything. Yeah, um, and in this case, like, or especially when you weave it into the character's um, development, it's like an integral part. It plays an integral role in the character's development. In Fantasian, it doesn't, right? Oh, okay. But say, in Final Fantasy VII with Cloud, it's like right. so integral to that character's whole yeah. arc and yeah. him like becoming uh, the character he's at the end of the game versus the beginning, right? It's, it's all like integral to the character. Xenogears is similar. Mm, like right. his recovery yeah, yeah. And, and his becoming a whole character again, is, is in the, the, the amnesia is integral to that journey. Mm. Here it's the same way. Yeah. So these memories are, again, he didn't just hit his head and forget. He has suppressed his memory. And there's a reason he did that. And this is something I was looking into too. The difference, like, what are some case studies of people doing suppressed memory like? Yeah. Um, and I won't go into case studies so much, but this is something I learned that I thought was fascinating. And that really kind of like made this whole idea something that I just thought was really cool in the way it was implemented in this game. So the way that most people think of memories, right, the way that memory works, and even science for a long time thought of it this way, was that memories are stored in like a filing cabinet of sorts. Oh yeah. You create a memory, like on, you record it on a, like a piece of paper sort yeah. of thing, you go stick it into a filing cabinet, and then anytime you want to retrieve that memory, you just go open the file, pick it up, there it is, this is the thing I remember, put it back. And, and it's the same every time. And that's absolutely <laughs> not at all right. how memory works. Yeah, yeah. You, you can train yourself to do something like that, like the memory palace, the idea yes. of a memory palace, right. or a mind palace. That's really hard to do. Yeah. It's really, and you basically have to have a photographic memory for that to work the way it's intended to work. Right. Yeah. What, what was fascinating to learn for me is that memory is not at all a retrieval process. No. It is a creative process. Yes, that's why it changes every time. Each yes. time you recall a memory, you you without knowing you modify it. Yes. Uh, but one of the things that that happens is your body will fill in the gaps. Your mind will fill in the gaps for the things that you've determined aren't important relevant yes. details. Right. So there's a few certain details that you'll say these are the important ideas of the memory. You'll remember those. Everything else gets forgotten. But each time you remember it, those details also start to warp. Yeah. Yeah, and so you, what's literally happening is your brain is recreating mm -hmm. the memory. So you have certain parts of the brain that are connected through neural networks. That yeah. that's happens through an exper a learned experience. So you, you go through an experience, you learn. What happens is that the, the synapses, the neural connections are made stronger so that you can sort of like connect Do it those quicker. easier it happens faster. next time. Yeah, yeah. That's how you learn something. It's how yeah. behaviors are learned in things. But what happens is that when, when the, it comes time to remember something, you are <laughs> literally recreating the yeah. memory. It's not being retrieved from somewhere or stored. You're like, you're, you're using the creative portion of your brain yeah. to like make it real in your mind again. And, and what's so interesting about that, and you just alluded to this, is some some studies were done on this, w particularly with like the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Oh, yeah. Where they asked people to recount their memory right after it happened. And then a year later, they asked them again to recount their memory of what happened. Yeah. And then a year later, so ah, two years, they did it and again. And just measure the differences. On average, 
the, after one year, 37% of the details were altered. Wow. And by year two, it was 50%. Wow. That's how quickly your memories are changed. Because that's, that's just of the details that you can recall yes. to somebody. All yes. the peripheral details, those are gone. Yes. Like those are completely changed. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And so they, <laughs> there's some fascinating research being done on this. It's still kind of preliminary, but it kind of started in the early 2000s where um, they had, I mean, since like the 1960s, right, they had sort of understood, uh, let's see, how can I break this down in a way that like I can be faster? Okay, <laughs> let me just like skip ahead a little bit. It's all good. So th what they would do is they would take a rat um, and they have like a floor that sort of like can be shock, like electrified or shocked. It oh, gives a small sure. shock to yeah. the rat on the floor. And they would uh, do a sound like a beep. And every time the beep would happen, they would shock the rat. Uh, yeah. And so the rat learns whenever I hear that sound, a shock is coming and they would yes. tense up. Yeah, so yeah. they would remember, ooh, that sound. Yeah. And they would sort of tense up. Now, one really integral part to memory is that there's like a protein synthesis involved. Oh, so yeah. you have to have certain proteins in order to even form a memory in the first place. Well, and that's maybe why the brain takes so much energy. Right. right? Yeah. So in the past research with rats, what they learned is that, or what they thought was if you train the rat to understand the noise and the shock, um, that memory is created and it's there forever. Right. But if the first time we're teaching the rat this, we introduce this drug that breaks down the proteins, mm that are necessary, the protein synthesis to, to that is form, necessary to form the memory, the, the rat will not remember. Oh. So every time it hears the sound, it's not aware because even though it went through that experience and learned it, it couldn't form a memory without oh. those proteins. So there was one researcher in the early 2000s who had this idea, it just came to him. What if we taught the rat to fear the sound, but then we introduced the proteins to it afterwards Will that affect the memory somehow? Okay. And initially they were like, no, of course that wouldn't happen. Let, don't even waste the money researching right. that. But eventually he kind of convinced them. And what they found is that after a rat had been taught <laughs> to fear the sound, right? Yeah. Then they were about to do, they, they introduced the drug, they do the sound, right? The rat forgot. Wow. They could erase the memory. Wow. Post having taught this rat this by introducing this drug. This drug could essentially erase memories. Well, that's not dangerous at all for <laughs> scientists to well, have. Well, it's, <laughs> it's the whole idea of the plot of um, Eternal Sunshine of, of the, the Spotless, Spotless Mind. Mind. Yeah, yeah. Is he wants to forget his relationship with right. this woman, and so he, he takes a drug that makes him forget it, right? A really interesting movie. Maybe we'll oh, cover it's very that good. Oh, on, I'd love at to, some actually. Point Let's add that to the, the list. The podcast, uh, the exclusive podcast. Yeah, I love that one. But... Um, it's so interesting because they, they kind of did an, an extra test to this, right? They like did an extra step where they had two different sounds. So it's like yeah. this sound oh. will give you shock and this one will. Man. But th when they introduced the drug for this sound, the rat forgot that that sound meant shock, but it remembered this one. So they know they can yeah. alter memories by doing this with this drug and like uh, breaking down the proteins, they can erase memory. Wow, so that's crazy. it's crazy. Nuts, right? But like that's essentially a process happening in the brain, and it, it opened my mind to the fact that like there are ways to literally erase or suppress memory. Do you <laughs> do you know what book I just finished reading today? What? 1984. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. The, the memory hole. Yeah. Anyways, oh my gosh, that's so funny. Okay, well, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Crazy right? stuff. So, anyways, we'll get more into like how this happened with Ashley's memory, right? But yeah, yeah, because they reveal a lot more later. This was really fascinating to me and it sort of opened my mind. So this is the kind of thing I like to see when you're gonna yeah. take a trope that's yeah, like yeah. common, do something with it. Sure. Spin it in some way to like make it more interesting. So I really like the way that yeah. they did it in this game. It's not amnesia, it's suppressed memory and there's actually a lot of validity to how this can happen. Um, nice. Again, I was just starting to research this today and. But there are apparently yeah. ways that you can actually induce this. I don't know how accurate it is or how true it is, but like there's tons of videos on YouTube yeah. of people like teaching you how to erase or suppress your memory so that you're not like obsessing over 
okay, these okay. cringe moments in your life and like <laughs> or this pain from a relationship you can like so sort of help you help kind you of get around it, it. Yeah, I don't yeah. I literally have no idea if this works but people in the comments were saying it's helped well, me and okay. maybe it's anecdotal but it's at least something that got my mind working and I'm going to keep looking into it. I know people who have suppressed memory syndrome yeah. specifically. Yeah. From and trauma and things like that. Yes, yeah. trauma induced. It's specifically that something horrific happened and they have forced themselves to forget. Um, and that can be useful as a coping mechanism early on. It, depending on what exactly it was, it is possible that you will still have to deal with that mm -hmm. at some point later on in your life. Yeah. You will still have to confront that and deal with it. But, right. um, you know, especially as a coping mechanism or as a survival mechanism. Right. That's something that, especially like younger kids, will be able to implement pretty quickly yeah. so that they can live and right. keep going on without being like held back. Yeah, exactly. Crazy stuff that happened to them, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I like with amnesia, though, I like the general idea of you're exploring your psyche. You're exploring yes. your own unconscious, right? Yes. So, um amnesia or repressed memory, either one, is is a good way of, of creating that extra layer. And we're talking about layers of storytelling, right? That also he's, not only is he going into a cave and fighting monsters, but he's also battling his own subconscious, which is symbolized by going into a cave and fighting monsters. Right. It's, it's, it's another layer of the whole thing. And amnesia is a, is a good way to do that because don't we all have amnesia, <laughs> really? To some degree. To, to a large, like 99% of what's happening in your life, you don't remember, you know? And so there's things like that. Also, Plato. Plato had this crazy idea that, um, well, I don't know how crazy it is. It might be perfectly not crazy. Um, that all memory, no, all knowledge is memory and that anytime you learn something, you're actually remembering it. Mm. That, that like true knowledge, the way that you gain knowledge is you're remembering something that you used to know, you know, mm. a long time ago. That was, a, that was something that Plato talked about. And this game, I think, is actually kind of calling to that a little bit with the idea that he's just remembering all this stuff from his past and every new skill he learns, it's like, no, he didn't learn it. He's he remembered it. it. Yes. And I think that's the platonic idea of, I, I, I don't know that you can't ever prove that, but I, I think most people don't think Plato was correct when he said that. But that is an idea that's out there. Yeah. Um, is that, you know, knowledge is essentially memory. Hmm. But <clears throat> it's good stuff. So. Oh yeah, so I also have a few notes here just talking about the general place that we're at. I'll go through this quickly because we're running out of time. Yes. Um, there's a bunch of symbols that I noticed. One of the big ones in a lot of the, the big rooms, I think this one with Sydney actually, uh, that for the scene we just talked about, has a bunch of roots all over the wall. And oh. you can tell by the way they're kind of jagged and curvy. They, they do a mix of jagged and curve, which is not common amongst a tree branch, but is more common amongst roots. It's kind of got a top down. Um, kind of flow to it. So these are roots, right? And what's cool about the symbol of roots is that not only does it signify that we are underground, but it signifies that there is a connection between where we're at and the above ground, right? Yeah. Now that may sound obvious, but within the subtext, within specifically what's happening within this game, um, the idea that uh, the roots um, are, con that, that what is happening in the underworld there is something similar ha that is or will happen in the above world because of what's happening in the underworld. Yeah. That there's a connection there. They're directly connected. And so the roots are cool. I love games like this where they are really, the designs are like really deliberate. Yes. Right? Because some games it's like, oh, like Zelda. It's the water temple. Okay, well, there's the designs because temples have designs, right? <laughs> but this seems yeah. too pointed. I don't yeah. think this is more an accident. Purposeful. I think yeah. this is more purposeful. There's also the... Um, a square inside, or a circle inside of a square, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the idea of squaring a circle, which is the, you know, you got your square and the circle meets all the edges and um, it creates four perfectly shaped, you know, little triangle things on the bottom. And you've got your square and your circle being essentially the same width and height, right? And that is symbolic. The circle is symbolic of heaven or perfection or meaning. Uh, and then the square is symbolic of earth or matter or imperfection, I guess, but well, it wouldn't be imperfection. It would just be m the material world, right? Yeah. And so um, when the circle meets the edges, that's where heaven meets earth, right? So they meet together. So if the circle's outside of earth, then it's the circle is surrounding earth. Earth is within the heavens, right? But this one has the circle that is smaller than the square around it, which symbolizes that the heaven is within the earth, essentially. Mm. And that 
it, well, it says heaven, but it would be the transcendent realm, the sure. perfection realm, yeah. right? And th this is a very, very common temple icon mm. that is um, symbolizes perfection when they when the edges meet when you can square the circle because that's the optimal point you know and then when they overlap but I, I'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> <laughs> when they overlap it means another thing because it creates yeah. eight pockets and the octagon which is the square turning into the uh, circle or the circle turning into the square depending on how you look at it yeah. um, but but um, the the heaven being found within the earth is interesting and I think it's important. Um, um, one of the things that Sydney is sort of trying to maybe do is create a, a, a transcendent realm within the earth that is, that exists, you know, yeah, that we're dealing yeah. with. Right. Um, I've got that. There's also um, the double helix. We're seeing that a lot, which symbolizes opposition, right? So you've got the two snakes, right? So there's the dueling snakes going up a pole. Right, and each loop of their, you know, the helix kind of makes a little circle going up to the top, and you see the snake heads, and it's up towards the light. So the snakes are the opposition is um, necessary and revolves around each other, going all the way up. Right, so th it's a transcendent idea, but that you need the opposites in order to work. So this is a dualistic, you know, universe. There, there yeah. is the, you know, it's dualistic. Right, there's the the good and the bad, and and the opposition in everything, and specifically. You know, that idea of the snake kind of wrapping up the pole is what symbolize the two snakes wrapping up the pole symbolizes yeah, yeah. that. Um, and that's an ancient Chinese and the, so idea. And these, these symbols are appearing on like the walls? Yeah. Of so Lamar. some of them are on the walls, some of them are on blocks, some of them are around doors like this. I specifically saw this double helix um, on each side of a doorway um, that was, I can't remember exactly which room it was. Um, but yeah, you're seeing these on the walls and. Um, Mostly on the walls, yeah. yeah. And it's cool. I think it's really cool. But the, the duality is important because this is, this is essentially an ancient temple that we're in right yeah, now. Yeah, right. And so you're seeing you know, what, what, it, what it all means, essentially. So complementary mm -hmm. opposites. I, put, I wrote down Fushi and Nuwa. Fushi and Nuwa were the two serpents that created China. Well, they created the world, but it's the Chinese uh, mythology. And they're the twin serpents with intertwining tails. And one of them is a woman who has a compass, and the other one's a man, and he's holding a square. And this is like thousands of years ago. Oh, wow. No, no. Did I say that wrong? No, I said that right. I said that right. Yeah, the square. And so they're each holding the tools of creation, right? But they each symbolize the opposition, right? And the compass, right. of course, symbolizes a circle, because that's how you draw a circle, so with the, the compass thing. Kind of a yin-yang thing. And then the square two, symbolizes right? the square. So it's a circle-square idea. Mm. It's just presented in a different way. But yeah, it's a yin yang, yin yang kind of thing too. Yeah, the the masculine, the feminine. Yep. Yeah. Which is super East Asian. So anyways, these uh symbols are super, super cool. And I was seeing them everywhere as we were playing. <laughs> and I often will see these I'll sometimes see these in other places, but they were here in abundance and I'm just I was connecting a lot of the symbolic imagery that I was seeing here and it's really cool because it fits. It yeah. really fits to the theme of, of the story, you know? Mm. Okay, so a little later, Ashley comes across a soldier who was kind of left for dead. He's like, his skin's all pale and yeah, gray, yeah, and yeah. he's bleeding, and he's kind of like begging him to stop the pain. <laughs> yeah. And, and then he watches as the man's spirit. It, it appears yeah, you can like see the spirit. His body, right? The soul right. leaves. And this is all going to be talked about by um, Grissom and Guildenstern <clears throat> here in a little bit, like yeah. the nature of souls in... Um, what does Lamont death mean? And true death and that yeah. sort of thing, right? Or uh, an incomplete death. Right, an incomplete death. But he, you see the soul just sort of like leave the body and like wander off. We're in a different place here because yeah. we saw lots of people die earlier on before like in the Greylands, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now that we're here in Lamond, and we've even killed a few people ourselves, but this is the first time that we can see the soul coming out, yeah. right? So the, the darkness is... Um, affecting the way that we're seeing things and we're, we're clearly we're getting deeper and deeper into what's going on here and um, we're starting to see stuff like that that's that's super unusual super right. unnatural um, but then the body comes to life as a zombie yeah, it becomes and a zombie. attacking him and so this is where you start seeing undead enemies yeah. a lot in the game uh, a lot of these crimson blades and uh, cultists of Mullen yeah. camp um, and have all that have died in these in the fighting that's going on, their bodies are reanimating and sort of like beginning to fight. 
And so uh, that's kind of like the introduction to that, and you start to see undead em enemies a lot more moving forward. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then later on, again, we see Harden, who has this ability to somewhat, like a clairvoyance almost, where he can, he can yes. like spy on yeah. their enemies throughout the city, who he can kind of see through. Well, I love their this. Eyes I love things. this because Harden's sitting there looking, but we also somehow can see. Yes. We can use that same type Ashley of power. Has the same power. But only if there there's a wave frequency kind of thing that they yeah. explain a little bit later. But we can only do it to some people. We yeah. can't do it to everybody. Right. Harden apparently can do it to more people. Right. Yeah. In this scene, Harden is watching Ashley as he's proceeding through Leomond. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, and he's sort of like projecting himself and like watching Sydney's enemies, but he's watching Ashley in particular. Um, and he's starting to get afraid of how powerful Ashley is becoming. Yeah. He's like, this, We're killing all these this guy is a freaking beast. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he's, he, the, the, the dragons and the monsters he is killing, like, this, this is like insane how strong he's becoming. Yeah. Right? And so we're starting to see a little bit of a rift. I guess we saw it a little bit in the opening scene, but it's getting more tense yes. between Harden and Sydney. And Harden is showing more of his doubt and calling this whole thing madness. He says, the blades will hold this town soon and we dare not face their undivided forces. We've no time to play cat and mouse. Because Sydney is alluding to this game he's playing with Ashley, right? Yeah. He's like, we don't have time for that. Like, yeah, yeah. This, what, what are you doing, right? And so Sydney's always trying to calm him down. Relax, <laughs> it's all part of the plan. Right. And, and this is where Harden says, were the Duke's betrayal and the Cardinal's meddling and the risk breaker strong as a bloody titan, all <laughs> part of your previous plan too, or your precious plan too, Sydney? Yeah. And this is alluding to what you were talking about earlier, that Sydney is not, maybe not necessarily yes. foreseeing everything. No. And he's taking risks. Yeah. And he, he feels, or he's giving the sense he's in control when maybe he's not totally in he's control. He's not totally in control. Right. He's, he's writing this loosely, but it is going vaguely how he wants. Yes. So he's like, well, and he's adjusting as things change. And I love how Sidney just looks at Harden in yeah. response to that. And Harden can't match it. It's kind of like um, you know, he looks away. Um, animals in the wild, where like the, uh, when you meet eyes, it's yes. like the one who the dominant like, one looks away. Yes, it's like yeah, it's like Sydney is definitely dominant here. All he has to do is look at him, and and Harden starts to apologize. It's like Sydney, forgive me, <laughs> right? Uh, so he's able to keep him under control for yeah. the most part here, Sydney, but it's it's. Yeah, Sydney is playing a dangerous game, and yeah. we're starting to see that a little bit, even though he's, at the moment, still kind of maintaining control on the situation. Yep. Um, so Merlos is just kind of watching all of this. Yeah, yeah. She's kind of observing how they're how they talk, and yeah, just kind of watching this and not just really saying think, much. Thinking, and, and like you yeah. said, later Ashley is going to start seeing through her eyes. Yeah. Uh, but there's a really cool animation here. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite shots in the game. So Sydney kind of like has this, there's like this, he kind of extends his hand and there's this brightness and the wind starts like flushing to it and you see like their hair sort of like animating, right? Yeah. And their clothes and things. It's just very impressive. The physics are pretty good, yeah. Impressive for PS1. Yeah, like yeah, really totally. impressive animation for the PS1. The effect of this magic is just like really cool. Um, anyways, at the end of this, Merlos starts to see a ghostly boy figure. Different than the one Ashley is seeing. Yeah. Ashley is seeing essentially what looked like his son from the, yeah. the scene in the field, right? But she's seeing basically a boy that looks like Joshua. Yeah. Joshua yeah. who was kidnapped yep. by Harden in the first scene, right? She's seeing yeah. a boy that looks like that. And he says here, I must help father. So vague, but she's like starting to see things like that too, right? So yeah. The power's emerging in her, it's emerging in Harden. Yeah. Of course, Sydney has all kinds of power, but Ashley, like everyone's gaining these powers by just, mm, being, just by being in the there. city itself. Okay, so after a ton of battles, Ashley sort of emerges from underground again. So he went through the undercity, or through the wine cellar really, now he's emerged into the city itself. And he's, yep. he's hearing bells, and he's sort of uh, listening in on a conversation between a character named Dwayne, Mm -hmm. Father Dwayne, who is receiving reports about some deaths from you know, other Crimson Blades and things. Yeah. Um, he, I really like this scene. He, he like strikes 
one yeah. of the soldiers in the face because he didn't verify the corpses. Yes, <laughs> the identities or whether they were truly dead or not. Yeah, kind of thing. because yeah, yeah. there's zombies emerging. I know, right? so they're like, like staying away from them. Yeah. yeah, so it's like, how did you not like check if they were dead, you know? Um, so he's kind of spying on that. He, he kind of comes around the corner a little later, hears some more knights talking. Um, just again about the about the the zombies. Uh, one of them, one of the soldiers says, "The cold ones will not walk under the sun. The cold, but ones, soon yeah. night will fall." Yeah. So it's kind of the idea that they won't walk in the light like the sun. Yeah. But when it's when it comes nighttime here, we're gonna have a problem with then these zombies out, emerging yeah. out. So it's a kind of a, you know, increasing the urgency of the situation. Um, so. A little further on, this is all still kind of on the surface level in the city proper now. He, there's, I don't know if it's a moat, but there's just kind of just like a waterway in between where Ashley is and where Grissom, who is the brother of Dwayne, on the other mm -hmm. side. And he's sort of interrogating this cultist who's got like a wound um, and uh, asking him about where Sydney is. The guy spits on in his face, basically. Yeah. And I love the response to that. It's kind of a slow, it sort of wipes. He, he just wipes. grabs the guy's head well, and just Well, then like he, he draws the, the cross. Oh, yes, he does. On That's right. his body. And then he just yes. takes slams his head the guy's head. Bam! Just, and you get this really nice like zoom with the camera for impact. Yeah. It's a really cool scene. And um, then he says, I, you're, you're going to die, but I will, I, what is it? You, you can pray to God for forgiveness of your sins before you die. Yeah, and the right. guy's like, shut up, and then he just dies. He disappears, though. He doesn't um, become a zombie. Yeah, he tells him to go to hell. Yeah. And then he, his body like dissolves or disappears. Yeah, I yeah. wrote that, too. This is where Guildenstern shows up with Samantha. And they're discussing how what they call the dark invades bodies like yeah. the plague and turns them undead. And Guildenstern explains that those who die in Leomond die what he terms an incomplete death, right? So he, he writes, and I love the dialogue here, trapped in purgation, they yearn for life, thus they seek bodies without souls, and the corpses that walk are born. So these are people stuck, their souls that are stuck in mm. Leomond, yeah. seeking a vessel. Yeah, okay. And sort of like re inhabiting a body again, kind of a thing, right? Mm. Trapped in purgation, they yearn for life. So they're stuck in this city. Wow. They, they're desperate to come back, right? And thus they seek bodies without souls and the corpses that walk are born. So Samantha begins wondering um, if she'll wander Leomond like that, you know? It, right. It's a little bit of like a flirtatious sort of like thing, like trying to get him to like comfort her. Yes. You know? yeah, oh, I wonder seems... if I'll walk. And then you know, the, the he's city's... like... He grabs her by the waist and pulls her, and pulls her in, her in yeah. and he's sure like, her that yes. uh, what they can find is true mortality. Yes. Right? That's what they're after. And this is what Ashley then realizes that this is what the Cardinal is really yeah. after in the city. The Cardinal is looking for true immortality, which Guildenstern is like, you know, exploring the city for the Cardinal to find. Yeah. And in stories, anyone who seeks immortality is, is a bad, bad guy. person. <laughs> it, it's so funny. It's almost like that's the trope. most deeply ingrained idea wi within humans of all cultures. Is like if you seek immortality, you're 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 bad, right? Mm -hmm. So, like if somebody who's given immortality, who already has immortality, that's fine. But if you're looking for immortality, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And that's like every culture in the world agrees that like, no, no, don't try to be immortal. That's, that's yeah. like the number one thing to not do. Yep. Can't do it. Um, and then uh, he's kind of watching all of this. Uh, oh, Ashley says, so the Cardinal seeks immortality. So he says that kind of to himself. Hmm. And this is where Dwayne so the comes around guy. the Cardinal. Church is bad. Yeah. Dwayne comes around the, cor the corner and says, an incomplete death's more than a VKP butcher deserves. Yeah. And so you gotta fight Dwayne and a couple of uh, the Templars that are with him. Um, and after killing him, right, after beating him, turn. you turn and see Guildenstern watching yeah, from across the Yeah, and so he waterway. sees us, so we've been caught, we've been yeah. found out. So Guildenstern now knows a VKP risk breaker agent is yeah. in the city. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, this is bad, because it's like, the the cardinal the church is trying to do this without consulting the VKP. Yes, which was the yeah. whole like prologue opening scene. The VKP yeah, is yeah. like, what the freak is 
the church doing? Why exactly. are they not talking to us? So now it's like, uh oh. Guildenstern realizes the VKP is here, they're on to us. Like, yeah. Okay. It, it, you noted, I see yes, you. Yes, <laughs> and he just turns and walks away very slowly. Yep. He's like, You can't get to me. Yep. I can't help but notice too, this city seems like it was built around water. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, that was kind of the thing we were wondering about earlier is was the water something that came in the tragedy of the earthquake? Yeah, it or seems like a Venice type there? city that just I mean there were waterways obviously that But I don't know built. if this is just a low graphic thing where it's like oh the, the there was a split in the earthquake and and the water came in later or if this city was really built that way. Yeah. I think it the city was built that way. That's the way it seems. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So we'll end here, but Ashley heads down below again back into the other under city. Yeah. And Rosencrantz, we see Rosencrantz beginning to follow him. So yeah. this is where Rosencrantz has entered the city now. Yes. And he's just sort of trailing Ashley for now, just kind of watching him, right? And so uh, Rosencrantz is going to become uh, uh, more of a factor in the story moving forward. So that's where we'll stop for now. We'll pick Sick. up uh, here next time. Um, I, I think where we'll finish for the next playthrough is at the end of the snow, uh, Snowfly Forest. Oh, okay, sure. Um, there's a big boss fight that happens at the end of the Snowfly Forest, and then a big reveal between Sydney and Ashley. Watch that cutscene stop playing there, and that's what we'll try to cover up to for the next episode. Okay. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This game is so hard. It was so hard for me to predict, like where to play to and how much we're going to break <laughs> yeah. down and like e each time yeah. it seems we're we get more into it than I anticipated we would and so the <laughs> progress has been a little slower than I thought uh, but this this probably it seems like this will probably turn into something like six ish episodes unless we just start flying through stuff but yeah. hopefully you're enjoying it and um, we're going to start a vote early um, since we're kind of already into this but Chrono Cross is coming out Yes. In early April. Soon, soon, yeah. And uh, we're thinking about maybe covering that game next. Of course, we're going to leave it up to vote. But since Chrono Cross Remastered is coming out soon, uh, we're going to put that on a vote on Patreon and Subscribestar. So um, that it'll be amongst other things. Um, so uh, if you'd like to vote um, at the $5 level on Patreon, the, you get voting rights. And so um, we will have a vote for the next game running when this goes live. Uh, so that we can kind of start preparing for that too. And we're not a week ahead anymore, so this, this when I say this, <laughs> I really mean it, like, this is happening like now. <laughs> yep. Um, so go check out <laughs> Patreon if you want to support the show. We appreciate everyone who does. We have the greatest patrons in the world. Yeah. And um, vote on which game you'd like us to cover next. Till next time, have a great week. Peace out. <laughs>